So good evening. Um, as Miriam said, I would like to share my views with you on how to um, uh, store and analyze large data silos, having in account how the modern computer architectures are evolving. So, a few words about me. I am a physicist by training, I am a computer scientist by passion, and I do believe in open source. And uh, the proof is that I spent uh, a, long, a long part of my life doing uh, open source development. Probably the project that I invested the most is PyTables, where uh, I spent uh, almost 10 years with it. Although my current pet projects are BLOSC, uh, and because I am going to talk uh, uh, quite extensi extensively about uh, the last ones during my talk. So why open source? Well, in my opinion, there is a big duality between dreams and reality. And uh, many times, uh, we, the programmers, think that uh, some things can be improved, right? The thing is to, 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 to try to find time in order to implement that. I am the, of the opinion that, uh, or I share the opinion with uh, Manuel Oltra, for example, that the art is in the execution of an idea and not in the idea itself, because there is not much left on an idea. So the open source allowed me to implement my own ideas, and it's a nice way to fulfill yourself while helping others as well. So I am going to talk, first of all, to introduce the need for speed. Uh, because the goal is to analyze as much as data as possible using the existing resources that you have. Then uh, I will talk about new trends in computer hardware because I think that uh, seeing the evolution of the computer hardware is, 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 is very important in order to design your data structures and your data containers. And I will finish showing you Bcalls, which is an example, just an example, of data container for large, large data sets that uh, follows the principles of these newer computer, the forthcoming newer uh, computer architectures. Okay, so why we need the speed, of course. Uh, I, let me remind you the main f uh, strengths of Python. Of course, I think one of the most important things uh, about Python is that uh, there is a, a rich ecosystem of data-oriented libraries, and most of you will know about NumPy, Pandas, scikit-learn, a lot of different libraries. And uh, also Python has a, a reputation of being slow, but uh, probably most of you also know that uh, it is very easy, or well, it is feasible at least, to identify the bottlenecks of your programs and then uh, mm, use or make uh, C extensions in order to reach C performance using excellent tools like Cython, Swig, or R2Py, or others. But for me, in particularly, what the most important thing about Python is interactivity, okay? The ability to be able to interact with your data and see your filters, uh, what's, uh, what the result of your filters the result of your queries almost in real time. This is the, the, key, the key thing about, about Python for me. But of course, if you want to handle big amounts of data and you want to do that interactively, uh, you need a speed, right? Because if not, uh, this is no, uh, a no-go. But designing code for data storage performance depends very much on the computer architecture. And that's, that would be the main point of my talk today. In my, in my opinion, existing Python libraries need to invest more effort in getting the most out of the existing and future, future computer architectures. Also, let me be clear about uh, the meaning of my talk. I mean, I am not going to talk about how to store and analyze data in big, uh, in big uh, clusters, or farms of big clusters. In my opinion, this is not exactly the niche of Python. I mean, the, 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 the real workhorse of Python is uh, being able to work uh, on big servers maybe, but especially and uh, mostly in laptops, okay? A lot of people is using Python in their, in their own laptops, and my goal is to try to help them 
in order to um, uh, work with uh, more data using, using laptops or big servers. But trying to optimize for laptops or servers doesn't mean that this is going to be a trivial task because these laptops, modern laptops or modern servers are very, very uh, complex beasts. Okay, we have to leverage uh, or we have to understand how the architecture is, is designed, how to access memory, how the different um, caches work, a lot of things. So let's have a look at uh, the current uh, architectures, okay, and see how these architectures should uh, be leveraged in order to design new data structures. Uh, the new trends in computer architecture are mainly driven by the, um, the nanotechnology, okay? And I think it's very interesting to see uh, how Richard Feynman predicted the, the nanotechnology explosion as soon as uh, like uh, almost 50 years ago. So I think it's, it's nice for you to, to check uh, this, this talk. Anyway. So I think that the most important thing with uh, memory architecture nowadays is the difference in speed, the evolution in speed between memory access time versus CPU cycle time. We know that the CPUs are, uh, are getting faster and faster. And in fact, they, uh, the speed uh, uh, grows up almost in an exponential way, not exponential, but close. So the Moore, the Moore law. But in contrast, the memory speed is increasing very slowly, very, very slowly. And this is creating a big gap, a big mismatch between CPU speed and memory speed, right? And this, uh, this is uh, a very important um, key on the evolution of the architectures. So if we see, if, if we see the, the evolution of the, of, of the architectures, we can see that um, in the 80s, for example, the architecture, the memory architecture of, of the machines of the, or of the computers was very simple, okay? Just a couple of memory layers, then the main memory and the mechanical disk. Then in the 90s or 2000s, vendors realized this problem between the, the, the mismatch between the memory and, and the CPU speed, and they started to introduce the two additional levels in the, in the, in the CPUs of cache, okay? And nowadays, in this decade, it's very usual to have up to six layers of memory, okay? So this is a big change in the paradigm, and it's not the same thing to program for a, for a machine in, the, in the, um, the 2010s than for a machine in the 80s. So in order to understand how we can adapt better to the new architectures, it's important to know the difference between reference time and transmission time. So let me explain. So when the CPU asks for a, for a, for a block of data in, in memory, uh, the time that it takes um, from the, the CPU request until the memory is starting to transmit, the data, it is called the reference time, okay? Or others call it uh, latency as well. And then the time that it takes once the request has been received and the transmission starts to start and, and on, until it ends, it is called the transmission time. Mm -hmm. The thing is, if you have a, a big mismatch between the reference time and transmission time, you are, kind, you are not doing an optimized access to your data. So the interesting idea is that the reference time and the transmission time should be more or less in the same order. But of course, not all storage layers are created equal. That means, for example, that in memory, which has a reference time typically of 100 nanoseconds, we can transfer up to one kilobyte in this, in this amount of time. But uh, for solid state disks, we, we, where the reference time is 10 microseconds, we can transfer up to four kilobytes, okay? Using the same, the same time. And for mechanical disks, this uh, block uh, typically the reference time is around 10 milliseconds. 
and the transfer and, uh, the, 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 um, the transfer uh, yeah the transfer uh, block uh, transmission time allows to transfer you one mega up to one megabyte. So the thing is that uh, the slower the media, the larger the block uh, that should be transmitted, okay, in order to optimize the memory access. And again, this has profound implications on how you access storage, as we will see uh, soon. Uh, let me finish uh, this part with uh, some trends on storage. Uh, the clear thing is that, uh, as we have seen, the gap between, uh, between memory and permanent storage, hard disks, is, uh, is, is, is large and it's, 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 in, it's uh, growing right now. And that means that uh, in order to fulfill or to, to fill this gap, vendors are not creating just SSD devices that are, um, are have the same, uh, the same interfaces than hard disks, than typical hard disk. Vendors are starting to create or to put solid state memory in buses like PC, PC, PCI. And also, it, um, new uh, uh, protocols are, uh, or new um, specifications are being started to, create, to, to be introduced in order to put all this solid state memory in laptops. So in your long, uh, own laptop will be able to access solid state memory at PCI speeds, okay? which is very different to access uh, solid state disk via the SATA, the traditional SATA uh, bus. And also, the trends on CPUs is that we are going to see more cores, of course, um, wider vectors for doing simple extraction and multiple data. And we are going, well, we are seeing already integration of the GPUs and the CPUs in the same time. And these are the trends that we should be, we should have in mind in order to define or in order to, um, to produce our new data containers. So what I'm going to do is to uh, show you an example of implementation that uh, data containers that leverages this, um, this, um, these new computer architectures. So because it's, uh, uh, it provides data containers, it's a library that provides data containers that can be used in a similar way than NumPy, Pandas, Dyant, or others. And in because, uh, Data storage is chunk, not contiguous, and chunk can be compressed. Mm -hmm. And there are two flavors. One is uh, CRA, which is meant to host uh, homogeneous types and in dimensional data, multidimensional data, and then C table for heterogeneous types in a columnar way. Uh, I, I am going to skip some sli slides because um, I, um, I am a little bit short of time. Don't be worried. The important thing that I want to transmit uh, will be the, the consequences of using these, uh, these containers. So I, I'm not going to explain in, in, in big detail the difference between contiguous and chunk. The, the only thing that is important is that uh, chunking is import, it's, it's, uh, nice because it allows to efficient enlarging and shrinking. Compression is possible. And in addition, chunk size can be adapted to the storage layer. Do you remember that depending on the storage layer that you are going to use, the chunk size should be different, right? So uh, a chunk in storage allows you to um, fine tune the chunk size for your own needs. So it has another, uh, other advantages like appending is much, much, much faster. You don't need a copy when you are doing um, uh, an append operation on a because container, less memory travels to CPU. And also the table container implemented in because is uh, columnar. So columnar means that the data in columns are next in memory. Okay, so when you want to fetch a record um, or a column, the, the only information that you need to transfer, so this is the, at, at, um, the case of a um, uh, table that is row-wise, row okay? Store it in a row-wise fashion. And if you're interested in this column, in 32, for example, you are going to transfer much more data into the CPU just because of ar architectural reasons. This is how, how our computers works right now. On a memory column, why, 
uh, on a, a column-wise table, if you are interested in just one column, you are going to grab only that column and transfer it into the cache. Okay? So that means also less memory travels to the CPU. Also, why compression? Well, the first thing is that uh, it allows uh, to store more data, either in memory or on disk. But of course, another, another goal is that if your data is compressed, maybe, maybe it would be better to have this data compressed in memory or on disk, transfer the compressed data into the cache and decompress it. And maybe this, the sum of this transmission time and this decompression time could be faster in some situations than the time that it takes to transmit the original data set into the, into the caches. And that's the goal of BLOSC, which is the compressor that is, uses vehicles behind the scenes, okay? BLOSC, the goal is to be faster than a MemCPY. Mm -hmm. It uses a, se a, a series of uh, techniques that I'm not going to describe, but basically leverages new uh, architectures. In this case, for example, we can see BLOSC decompressing five, up to five times faster than a MemCPY. I'm not going to describe how BLOSC works. There are other talks about this. And the main, the main uh, place uh, to, to use BLOSC is basically to accelerate um, the input-output, not only in mechanical disks, but especially on the solid-state disks and main memory. BLOSC, it's a, it's a library made in C, and uh, it is wide, widely used. And especially, it is uh, it is being used, for example, in OpenPDB and Houdini, which is um, a library for producing animation, 3D animation movies, and maintained by DreamWorks. Thank you. Uh, there are a series of projects using Bcalls already. Uh, for example, Visual Fabrics BigQuery, which is meant to do to produce out of core group buys, but uh, on disk, not in memory because Bicol supports both containers on disk, in, on disk and in memory. Also, Continuous Blaze is using Bicol's Quantopian. Also has, um, they are very excited about using Bicol's. Uh, I'm going to skip that. I mean, these are uh, mm, plots where people are showing how Bicol's can beat Mongo or SD5 for their own use cases, of course. And uh, I'm going to close the talk where uh, saying that, uh, well, chances are that there is a data container that fits your needs. Out, uh, and and this, this container should be already out there, okay? So my advice is always for you to check the existing libraries and to, to choose the one that fits your needs. And sometimes you can get, uh, you can be surprised and um, depending on the structure, that structure that you're using, you are using, you can get much more performance. Not because of the algorithm, but because of the data structure or, the, or data container. Also, you should pay attention to hardware and software trends and make informed decisions about your current development, which by the way will be deployed in the future. So it's important that uh, you Mm, are conscious about the new computer architectures because uh, you are going to use them or your applications is going to use them. And finally, in my opinion, compre compression, well, I think, um, I think I, uh, many people are uh, seeing that already. Compression is a useful feature, not only to store more data, but also to process data faster under the right, the right conditions. Okay, so let me conclude my talk with uh, my own version of a quote by Isaac Asimov, which I, uh, I was a huge, fa huge fan when I was a teenager. So uh, it is change, continuing change, and inev inevitable change that is the dominant factor in computer science. And in my opinion, no sensible decision can be made any longer without taking in, into, into account not only the computer as it is now, but the computer as it will be. Okay, so thank you very much. Um,
Questions? Okay. I, yeah. Also, I also have an announcement. I will be talking about uh, continuing. We get a question. We get a question. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, just maybe um, because there are some graphs about this, but just uh, to know, for example, there was some comparison with Mongo. Um, there are some, like for example, Blusk, very snappy. Uh, so I don't know to which reference it is. Just like because I haven't heard so much about it before. Um, yeah, if you what you know or what you see as difference for similar patterns that were tried by other persons. Just if you have some comparisons, if you if there are some advantages of the technologies you presented. So you mean that Mongo is using a Snappy, right? Yeah, for Wire Tiger, for one storage engine, for example, they're using Snappy or Zlib, but uh, Snappy yes. is faster for compressing, for example. Uh, but there are other things. There's also RocksDB for that's used for many yeah. things. That's a good question. And because, as I said before, uh, it uses a BLOS behind the scenes. Blosk is, I said that this is, it is a compressor, but it was an oversimplification. Blosk is actually a meta compressor. So Blosk can use different compressors, and in particular it can use Snappy behind the scenes. It can use Zlib, uh, LC4, which is the kind of uh, new trend in compression because it's very fast and it compresses very well as well. And it also, it also has support for Blosk LZ. So you have a range of compressors that you can use in order to tailor or to um, yeah, fine tune for your applications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, maybe a silly question. I've, I've just been to a talk on Numba, and uh, they claim to, to speed up NumPy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, does B calls work with uh, Numba? Yes. I mean, yeah, B calls is, is only providing the the data layer, I mean the data structure, right? On top of the data structure, it provides very few uh, machinery. It just provides some uh, uh, um, SAM, for example, the SAM function, but very little. So the idea is to use uh, B calls, for example, and on top of that, you can put Numba, for example, for doing uh, for doing computations. But you can also put um, Dask, for example, which is a way to do computations in parallel as well. And you can put whatever. B calls is providing a generator uh, interface so that other, other layers on top can leverage that. You are not bound to use B calls infrastructure, uh, B calls uh, machinery for doing computation, but it only provides the storage layer, so to say. Mm -hmm. I get a related question. Um, can yep. you use pandas with um, B calls as the storage engine? Sorry, can you repeat? Can you use pandas with uh, B calls as the storage engine? With us? Pandas. Ah, a comparison with pandas. No, not a comparison, but can you use pandas, like all the API of pandas, and still have um, uh, B calls as the storage engine? Uh, the storage engine, yes, yes, exactly. That's another application, for example, yes. And for example, I've seen uh, some uh, references by uh, Jeff, I don't remember his name, the current maintainer of Pandas. Um, yeah. uh, he's, he's trying to see, for example, Pandas can support different backends, like SQL databases or um, SDF5, and because can be another backend for, for Pandas itself, yes. So it can be, but it isn't now? No, okay. well, I mean, there is no, I, I miss in my, uh, in my knowledge, there is no uh, a backend for pandas yet, okay. but it, it could it could be done. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No. Okay. So um, this was everything. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, just let you know that this was the last talk of this room. Now there will be lightning talks at quarter past uh, five, and and that's everything. Please go into the app guidebook in your mobile phones and read the talks you are attending to. Okay, so, okay, so before leaving, just let me a uh, quick reminder. I will be driving a tutorial on Wednesday. I will be talking more about uh, all these uh, data containers and doing comparisons between B calls, pandas, uh, storage layers, NumPy, things like that. If you're interested, please come with us. Okay, thank you.